the great American statesman Thomas Jefferson had a remedy how to handle anger. He included it in his Rules of Living, which describes how he believed adult men and women should live. When it comes to anger, he writes this. When angry, count ten before you speak. When very angry, count a hundred. About 75 years later, Tom, or Mark Twain revised Jefferson's words. He wrote, when angry, count to four. When very angry, swear. <laughs> now those of us with a streak of honesty will have to say we've probably tried everything from Jefferson's philosophy to Twain's, <clears throat> uh, and we still can't seem to get a handle on anger very effectively. For most of us, it's a real problem. It has a way of disarming us to rob us of our testimony. It can injure our home lives and our relationships with co-workers, neighbors, and friends. If left unattended, it can even have damaging effects to our physical health. As we are continuing in our series called Stress Fractures, we come to the subject of anger. Now, I'm sure we all know what anger is. We know what it looks like. We know what it feels like. We know what it's like to have somebody angry at us. But maybe we have not considered why we get angry. How anger can adversely affect our lives in many ways. And ultimately, how do we deal with it? And again this morning, as we address this subject, I want to consider the symptoms, the diagnosis, and the prescription for this particular stress fracture in our lives. The symptoms of anger are very obvious. Often a person's face will turn red. You might see the veins of their neck stand out. For some, it's the clenched fists. Stumbling for words, these all indicate that a person is angry. How many of you have heard or maybe yourself have said, I'm so mad I can't see straight? Heard that phrase before? Do you know that that's a physical reality? When we are angry, the anger clouds the visual centers of our brain. So literally, you may not be able to see straight if you're very angry. Other cues include a decreased appetite, feeling unusually hot or cold, muscle tension, increased breathing and heart rate, dry mouth, loud, rapid, or high-pitched speech. You may experience stomach upset or churning, clenched teeth, twitches or anxious, anxious behaviors like tapping a pencil or, or shaking your foot, walking hard and fast, pacing back and forth. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but you get the idea. When we or somebody we know is angry, you can often tell just by their body language. What's happening to them are indications that they are angry. Now, if those are the symptoms, what's the diagnosis? And in my study, I came across several very interesting definitions of anger. Calvin Miller writes vividly, Anger is that unbridled emotional storm that makes one unpredictable and dangerous. <clears throat> and I think we can see that in our own lives and in the lives of those around us. Another resource states, Anger can most often be defined... <clears throat> as an emotional response to a perceived wrong or injustice. I like that definition because it's not just to a wrong or an injustice, but it's perceived. It doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be true. But if we think it is, we respond to it. But the one definition that struck me the most was this. Anger is a strong emotion of irritation or agitation that occurs when a need or expectation is not met. 
I like that definition because it shows that some anger is legitimate while some anger is not. You see, not all anger is sin. You find many times in the scripture where God is depicted as angry. Jesus, when he was here on earth, was angry and he displayed that anger. There are some occasions when we ought to be angry. As Christians, Scripture commends righteous indignation. When we hear of hideous cruelty, when others are attacked, assaulted, defrauded, we ought to be outraged. Henry Ward Beecher said, A man that does not know how to be angry does not know how to be good. A man that does not know when, how to be shaken to his heart's core with indignation over things evil is either a fungus or a wicked man. <clears throat> Rather picturesque terms there. Paul writes in Ephesians 4.26, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. You see, you can be angry and not sin. That is a possibility. And God himself is an example of that. Jesus was an example of that in his life on earth. But we need to be careful. As Paul said, in your anger do not sin. It is easy for anger to lead to sin. That's where we have to take care. And we're going to consider how to do that in a few moments. Now what does anger do to our bodies? Uh, some of this probably sounds like a broken record because each week as we deal with these various, what I'm calling stress fractures, these things that cause stress in our lives, it has the same effect on us. And when we are angry, uh, you see the heart beating more rapidly, arterial pressure rises, blood is shifted from the stomach and intestines to the heart, central nervous system and muscles. Uh, sugar is freed from the reserves in the liver. The spleen contracts and discharges uh, its contents and adrenaline is secreted. Basically, we have an adrenaline rush when we're angry. In fact, I'd read that anger is energy. And I think that's true. Have you ever noticed that? When you're really, really angry, there's a lot of pent-up energy. You want to go do something. Usually something destructive. <clears throat> but, but it is. It, it produces energy. Now what happens when that anger is not released, when it is kept inside? If the anger is not resolved quickly, the body will adapt to a higher level of arousal, just as if we moved out to a desert region and your body adapts to a higher temperature. It stays at that heightened level. And so we live with a rapid heartbeat. We live with more adrenaline pumping through our system. And that has a damaging effect on our lives. In fact, uh, doctors will call that essential hypertension. And it can be a real issue. I've mentioned several times in this series a book by Dr. Archibald Hart called Adrenaline and Stress. And he shows how the overexposure of stress is damaging to our bodies. But he suggests that anger is more damaging than most stress generators because it triggers that fight or flight reaction more easily and strongly than any other emotion. Yes, you'll, fear, you'll feel that when you are worried when you're fearful, and some of the other things we're going to look at later on, but anger, more than anything else, triggers that stress response. And it triggers it more and longer than anything else. So anger can be a real health hazard. He illustrates the point this way. This truth came home to me forcibly several years ago when I was on a speaking tour in Australia and decided I'd learn, to throw how, learn how to throw a boomerang. Early one sunny morning during a break, I enrolled in a boomerang school at a nearby park. The instructor showed us how to stand, how to hold the boomerang, and how to throw it. 
And I did exactly as had been instructed. That little piece of twisted wood left my hand like a bullet, twirling furiously as it, dis- as it went in a wide circle. And then as I stood there watching it in awe, it started coming back toward me. And the instructor shouted, Duck! <laughs> So luckily I obeyed or I'd have been seriously injured. That sucker passed right over me where my head had been, spinning furiously. Boomerangs are dangerous weapons. And then it hit me. So is anger. It injures the one who throws it. Another person has said, Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to the person on whom it is poured. Think about that. Anger is destructive to the person who carries it with them. And a tragic example of this we find in Scripture is the story of Cain, the first human being ever born. We're told that Cain and his brother Abel grew up together. Without going into all of the details of the story, Cain became angry at Abel. And God confronted him on this. And in Genesis 4, 7, he says to Cain, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. God is saying to Cain, Anger is like a tiger or a lion that is ready to pounce. It says it desires you. That's a very strong word meaning it wants to control you. It wants to overtake you. But, God says, you must master it. Don't allow that anger to control you, you must control it. Unfortunately, Cain did not master his anger, and in the end he murdered his brother Abel. And the story has been repeated throughout history. It continues on to today. More murders are the result of uncontrollable anger and rage than premeditated planning. Every year, anger causes drivers in road rage to kill tens of thousands of people. Every year. You see, too many times where disgruntled employees or ex-employees will go back to their place of work with an automatic weapon and, and not only kill the person that may have fired them, but anybody else that's in their path. All because of anger and rage. Physical and psychological abuse is often born in anger, as is the destruction of property. Now why is that? Why is anger such a problem in the human race? Well, I'd like to go back to that definition I mentioned earlier. Anger is a strong emotion of irritation or agitation that occurs when a need or expectation is not met. Now, when God gets angry, it's not because a need is not met, because God doesn't need anything. But He does have expectations. And when His holy expectations are not met, which is the definition of sin, God gets angry. God is justifiably angry at sin. And that's righteous anger. He hates what sin does to His creation. He hates what sin cost His Son. He hates what it does to people. Therefore, it is legitimate. It's it's righteous anger. Consider how different Jesus' anger is from our own. His anger was over injustice and unrighteousness. But that's very different from our anger. See, His anger was never about His stuff 
It wasn't about his agenda, his schedule, his rights, his desires, his preferences. And that's what our anger is almost always about. It's about us. It's about what we want. It's about what we expect. And if you don't meet that, I'm going to be angry. In short, our anger tends to be selfish in its base. Whereas God's anger is based on His holiness. Now there's three primary causes to human anger. There is frustration when we feel that things don't go according to our plan. There's humiliation when we feel that people are looking down on us. And then there's the resentment we experience when we face the rejection of others. Frustration, humiliation, rejection. Those are three basic causes of our anger. And the common component of all of these is that life has not turned out the way we wanted, not the way we expected or hoped. And on reflection, this expectation may be totally unrealistic, such as, I expect to live in good health forever. (laughs) Got news for you, that ain't going to happen. Ask anybody that's in their golden years. Yeah, you know it. We're not always going to experience good health. Or I never expect it to rain when I have outdoor plans. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. Sometimes our expectations are totally unreasonable. Now, sometimes they might be a little more reasonable. I mean, I expect my family or my friends to treat me with respect. That's reasonable, isn't it? It is to a point. In theory, yeah, that's true. But in reality, even your friends and family are human. And there are going to be times when they don't act the way they should and they don't treat you the way they should. To the point that I would say you can expect that to happen. Expectations have a lot to do with anger. And when we live on high expectations on ourselves and other people and even events that are outside of our control, we are setting ourselves up to be frustrated, disappointed, and to become angry. Now the manner in which a person reacts to an experience of life that doesn't turn out as hope depends on a great variety of factors. Uh, Sometimes it's on the nature of the expectation. Uh, Some things we hope for. I hope that it doesn't rain when I've got this picnic planned on Saturday. I hope my team wins the ball game or the championship. We have very little or no control over it. And so our expectation level might not be that high. But there are other things that we expect very strongly. How people treat us. Life should always be fair. Now you may not say it, but you may feel it. So that every little injustice sets you off. We may feel I have rights. And I demand that my rights be honored. And if they're not, you're going to get angry. So some of it depends on uh, how much you're vested into that expectation. But what it boils down to is anger often stems from these unfulfilled expectations that we demand to be satisfied. Once again, the emphasis is on self. Our demands tend to be self-centered, egocentric. Now, we don't think of it that way, but oftentimes that is the final analysis. 
We get mad when we don't get our way. Now, we've got all kinds of excuses for our quick temper. We blame our nationality. We blame our heredity. We might even blame the color of our hair (laughs) for you redheads out there. But in reality, our anger is a bad fruit of selfishness. You see, at the core of every human personality is what the Bible calls the sin nature, or you can call it the selfish nature. We're born with it. From our first breath, we believe that the whole world revolves around one person, me. Right? Even babies. They want what they want when they want it. 2.30 in the morning doesn't matter. Mom and dad have to get some sleep to get up in the morning to go to work. Don't care. I want fed. I want changed. I want to be held. And nobody else matters. You say, I'll quit picking on babies. I'm just showing you, we're born with it. It's not a product of our environment. It's not because of what we watch on television. It's not the kind of friends we hang around. We're born with it. David said in Psalm 51, I was a sinner from the time my mother conceived me. And he's absolutely right. We're born with a sin nature. And when we don't get our way, the natural reaction is anger. Babies cry. Toddlers throw tantrums. Young people throw things. Sometimes not so young people throw things too. Some curse and scream. Why? They don't get what they want. Their expectations haven't been met and they feel wronged. I think another element that fits into this very closely is the area of pride. Pride feeds anger. And as it grows, anger reinforces pride. So in addition to the frustration we feel when our expectations aren't met, our pride is injured when we're not treated the way we think we should be. And injured pride often leads to anger. So, what can we do about it? What is the prescription for anger? Unfortunately, there's no quick fix or an easy anger or easy answer. There's no take two of these pills and call me in the morning to fix the problem. The first step in dealing with anger is to make sure we have all the facts before we jump to a conclusion. There's a scripture in James chapter 1 verse 19 that I think is Wise counsel for all people. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak. And slow to become angry. Think about those three activities. How often would any combination of those have kept us from really embarrassing ourselves? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. God gave you two ears and one mouth, and I think there's something significant to that. How do we often describe anger as flying off the handle? Anger often comes in a burst. We are quick to anger, but the Bible says we should be slow to anger. Too often we react to a situation without thinking, without listening, without getting the facts. We assume that we know and therefore we explode. Take a breath. Count to ten. Maybe count to a (laughs) hundred. I wouldn't advocate Mark Twain's advice, by the way. Take a breath, find out, ask questions, listen. Notice James' words, slow. 
The idea of being slow to anger is it gives you time to think. C.S. Lewis said, anger is the anesthetic of the mind. When we're angry, our mind just goes numb, right? Because we say things and we do things that later we're like, what I do that for? Why did I say that? Because your mind wasn't in operation. Your heart had taken over. You're so controlled by your emotions that the intellect has gone right out the window. Slow. Think. Listen. Two passages in Proverbs speak to this. Proverbs 16.32 Better a patient man than a warrior. One who controls his temper more than one who takes a city. How important is it to control our temper? Proverbs 29.11 A fool gives full vent to his anger but a wise man keeps himself under control. I know there are some that say, when you're angry, let it out. It's not good to keep it inside, so express it. Let everybody know how you feel. Hmm. Usually not a good idea. I'm reminded of a quotation by Abraham Lincoln. Better to be thought a fool and kept silent. Than to, remove your, than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <clears throat> and usually when we're angry, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> Better to be patient, to control that temper. Remember, Paul lists self-control as one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. He puts that at the end. I think he does it on purpose. Because <laughs> that's the clincher. If you can get to the point where you're in self-control, wow, you're going to avoid an awful lot of issues. Next, we must distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate anger. Righteous anger is a reaction to a moral wrong that we witness. We share God's opinions on the matter. But what can we do about righteous anger? First and foremost, we need to pray. When you see something happening that is just flat wrong, pray about it. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Ask God to do something to right that wrong. Now understand, He may not act as quickly as we want Him to, because we want it done now. And His timing isn't always ours but we can share that anger with God. We can agree with Him that this isn't right. There's an old saying that somebody makes you angry, tell God on them. Not exactly sure what that means, but I get the gist of it. <laughs> Take it to the Lord. He understands. If you find yourself angry with someone, pray for Him. Because anger cannot continue in an atmosphere of prayer. One thing we are not to do, even with righteous anger, is to take matters into our own hands. The Bible is filled with people who had every right to be angry, but when they took it upon themselves to right the wrong, they failed miserably. Moses saw the Israelite slave being abused by an Egyptian taskmaster. Was that wrong? Yes. Was Moses right to be angry? Yes. But when he took matters into his own hands and killed the Egyptian, he set back the release of the Israelites 40 years. David's son Absalom was correct in his anger against his half-brother Amnon who raped his sister Tamar, but that Anger led to murdering his brother. Leviticus 19.18 tells us, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Does it surprise you that love your neighbor as yourself is found in Leviticus? <laughs> it's there. That's where it starts. 
Paul quotes Deuteronomy and Proverbs in Romans 12, verses 19 to 21. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For as it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, our society says fight fire with fire. And if somebody wrongs you, wrong them back. And don't just get even. <laughs> Up at a, a score, right? That's how we're told to hanger, handle anger. You strike back. You defend yourself. But is that God's way? To paraphrase the old Greyhound commercial, leave the vengeance to God. Let Him take care of it. James 1 verse 20 says, The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Even when our anger is righteous, it's not up to us to make things right. Unless it's something we're doing and then we're in control of it. But very seldom is that the case. Now, when, even when our anger is legitimate, we should not hold on to it. verse I read earlier from Ephesians 4.26, Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Deal with it. The sooner we bring our anger under control by addressing ourselves to its source, the better. It is damaging to our health to hold on to anger. We're going to see in our next study what happens to anger when it's kept. It turns into something else that is also a stress fracture and can be very hazardous to your health. How do we know if our anger is wrong? Well, anger becomes sinful if it's a resentful reaction to someone threatening our personal wants or needs. In other words, when it's selfish. In James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you can't have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You say, well, I didn't see anger in that passage. No, but quarrels and fights usually stem from anger, don't they? Isn't that usually the next step in the process? And I think this passage strikes at the very core of most of our anger, and that is selfishness. It's that smothering absorption with getting our way, having our needs met, being acknowledged, being understood, being cared for, being catered to, being listened to. And that often brings us in conflict with others. People don't come through with us, and that makes us angry. An anger that can quickly become blind rage, cruelty, and even violence. The answer is to give up this ruthless pursuit of our own pleasure and ask God to supply what we desire in His time, in His way, and pray as Jesus did in the garden, not my will but yours be done. Sometimes our expectations are too high. I often counsel people, lower your expectations. It's amazing what a difference that can make in your life. Let me give you a silly example, and yet it's true. I like to golf. Well, I don't know if you'd call it that. And I've found that as I've golfed more, I enjoy watching golf on television. I remember growing up and seeing golf tournament on television and thinking, that is the dumbest thing ever. It's like watching paint dry. Really? But then when you start doing it, you can understand what they're doing and the, the, some of the terminology and, and the, that kind of thing, and, and you can appreciate it. But if I'm watching that saying, wow, look how easy that is, I should be able to do that. <laughs> Lower your expectations. And you're not frustrated as much. You can enjoy yourself more. 
And even if you lower your expectations, you may have to reevaluate them and lower them even more, as I'm discovering this year. <clears throat> it's that way with life. If you find yourself easily angered, easily frustrated, easily irritated, step back and look at your expectations. What do you expect of the people around you? You say, well, I don't expect anything more of anybody else than I expect of myself. Well, that might be the place you need to start. You may need to lower your expectations on yourself. Give yourself a break. And once you do that, you can give other people a break too. Many people I know that deal with anger issues are angry more at themselves than they are anybody else. But it's still anger. It still has the same destructive end. So lower those expectations. Last week we sang the hymn, Jesus Never Fails. <laughs> He's the only one we can say that about. Your spouse, your parents, your children, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, whoever, they are going to fail you. They may not even want to, but they will. Come to a lower expectation and greater understanding. Grow in grace and mercy, which being interpreted is give them a break. Give yourself a break. You're not always going to get it right. And that's okay. So let's, let's wind this down. How do we deal with anger? Here's some common, though not always healthy, ways of dealing with anger. You can repress it. Don't even acknowledge it. Just stuff it down. But if you do this for a long period of time, repressed anger will cause big-time problems. We're going to look at them next week and something called resentment. Repressing anger is not a good idea. The other end of the, of the uh, spectrum is express it. Whatever you feel, let it out. It's healthy, it's good for you. That part's true. I, I am very much for expressing emotions and, and getting it out, but you've got to be careful when and where you do that and to whom. There's a good way to do that and a, a bad way to do that. You can suppress it. Now, it's not the same as repressing it. You're acknowledging the anger. You just don't express it publicly. What tends to happen, though, is that it vents itself through sarcasm. It's projected onto other people or other situations. Uh, this is the classic example if you're angry at work but you can't tell off your boss, so the guy comes home and he yells at his wife. Well, his wife can't yell back at the husband, so she yells at the kid. Kid can't yell back at mom, so he kicks the dog. You know, we, we, we shift it to somebody else. That's not good either. I think the healthy way to deal with anger is to confess it. Acknowledge it to God. Find someone in your life, that it is safe to talk to them and say, I am really angry about this. Maybe it's someone you can pick up a phone or you can go to and you say, I am really, really angry. I need to talk. Talk it out. That's good. But it's got to be someone that understands you, someone that's not going to be easily hurt, someone that's not going to quickly judge Someone that's mature enough that they can take it. It's not going to change the way they view you when you express how you really feel. And they can talk to you and they can maybe calm you down. They can talk some sense into you because right now your mind isn't in charge. Your heart is. But somebody can help you get control. That's a very practical way of dealing with the anger we feel. Remember, anger is just one little letter away from danger. And anger can be very dangerous if it's not handled properly. 
It's, it's like a bomb ready to go off. We need to defuse it. So how do we deal with anger? Understand what it is. Maybe lower some of those expectations that we have on others, on ourselves, on events that are outside of our control. Acknowledge it to God and ask Him for help in controlling it and understanding it and find somebody with whom you can be honest and open and share and you'll find that that anger doesn't have to control you. We must master anger before it masters us. And with God's help, we can do that. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we sang earlier in our service today, I need thee every hour. And that temptation to get angry is an every hour assault. We're so weary of the battle. And yet each day introduces another set of irritations that bring that cauldron of our souls to a slow boil. It isn't long before our thoughts and our tongues spill over with bursts of anger, sometimes so strong it frightens us and can fracture our relationships with others. We come to you with a simple yet sincere request, nothing elaborate, no bargaining, no hidden motive, just a direct, specific, one-word prayer to you, our only hope, help. Help us with circumstances that corner us. Help us with people who aggravate us. Help us handle comments that stab and sting. Help us to have enough discernment to be angry about the right things and yet enough control to hold it in check when we should. Help, Lord. We need you every hour. It's in the all-powerful name of your Son that we pray. Amen.